mine is the <laughs> I'm Roger Clapp. I think I know most of you out there. I'm the director of the Watershed Association of the Tuckasee River. Had the job for about eight, nine years now. And this is one of our public meetings. And we try to have four a year. And so welcome. And let me do some acknowledgments and cover a few things. And then we'll get on to Jennifer's talk on uh, landslide risk in worry hut watershed. Um, I've got some board members here, uh, Bill Kane over here, appreciate it, and uh, Gerald Green, who's the county planner. Thank you, Gerald. And uh, some water volunteers back there. Say, Smurl, hiding in the back, uh, mm -hmm. runs our cleanups on Saturdays over at Monteith Farmstead Park. I appreciate that. And uh, Zach is helping me out in a number of ways, and I appreciate that too. Uh, spring events, grants, and grant opportunities. Okay. Uh, I'll talk in a moment about an RT Car Cherokee Preservation Foundation grant. But I want to tell you we also have a facility that we built over at Monteith Farmstead Park. And to you students and a couple others, if you haven't been there, please go. Because what it is, it's all of the reasons that you need natural stream slopes if you're going to have healthy streams. If you want those streams to kind of look like they did in all of the untold years with all the fish diversity and everything else, uh, you need to have natural stream banks. And if they're really put in by volunteers, it's a great little major trail. Uh, and we'll be doing more work. This Saturday, no, Saturday the 29th, we'll have a training in macroinvertebrate uh, sampling. And it's one of the ways that the state finds out whether the water is uh, degraded or whether it's healthy in an ecological sense. So when, if you take that training, you learn how to put out a kick net, which is about a meter by meter square. You have a buddy <coughs> upstream that kicks the rocks all around. And lo and behold, all of the little goodies come on down and they land in this screen. You take them off and uh, for the, the next few minutes you pick at them and put them in various cubicles where you can count them. Uh, if you take this training, which is been optimized for our area and for non-scientists. Uh, 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 there are 43 organisms that you identify. And you don't remember them all from the first training. You're there with a buddy and you learn them over time. To do it though, you have to commit to sampling one or two streams in Jackson County uh, as part of this. The 29th annual Tuck the CG cleanup on Scott Street while everybody else uh, goes for the raucous raft rides to go on down in the main gorge. Uh, we send our crews out, as do others, into the tributaries of the watershed. And we'll be seeing them in Scott's Creek again this year. Not just in the park where we are, but up and down the whole area. Greening up the mountains is on the 26th, I believe, of April. We'd love to have volunteers for that. It's the summer picnic, the date hasn't been really firmed up, but it's always a lot of fun. It's probably down in Swain County. Okay, river cane and fish harvesting and ecology and culture. Uh, and since my board man is here, uh, we got the grant. Oh, so very good. <laughs> <laughs> so we got $13,500 and it kind of is an accumulation of some things that we've been doing, but you kind of got to think about it. Two very important cultural things are river cane for crafts for the Cherokee and uh, fishing and their relationship to the river. Uh, and for that, and you can't see it, there's a line of rocks here, there's another line of rocks here, and all of them add up to a V 
in the river. And that's a uh, fishing weir that's still somewhat intact in Webster. And those kids are herding fish, we believe, towards the track. <laughs> 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 which we hallucinate a little bit. Uh, uh, we don't don't judge us by the volume or the the mass of fish that we catch. <coughs> judge us by the fun we have <laughs> and the stories we do. But that's part of it. So we'll do that again with this grant. Uh, we'll also promote River Tang. Uh, we'll build a display at Monty Farmstead Park. Uh, citizen scientist. This SMIE training that's partially going to be covered by this grant. Uh, youth activities, the traditional Cherokee fish harvest, and for us the tradition is having an officialist harvest, but we have fun, and uh, uh, we, they have a biology lesson beforehand. And then a trip to UT Knoxville, where they go to the anthropology uh, department. And this, you have to take a little grain of salt, because if you take a, there's the science viewpoint of the heritage of the of the Cherokee, and there's a traditional viewpoint. So we usually end up with some really good discussions with each other, people on the go. Then February of next year, we'll host a type of CG workshop, ecology and cult culture. The river cane and the fish weirs, they're off campus, they're off the reservation. So if they're to be preserved, it means Cherokee and non-Cherokee have to work together. And that's kind of a nice challenge to me to some people there. It might sometimes comfort zones get a little bit pushed around, but so be it. Uh, that's small compared to some of the other things going on. Here's more on the macro invert uh, monitoring, training about six hours in this upcoming Saturday. It's over at St. Francis Church in Cherokee. And really what you're looking for are these bugs. Mayfly, stonefly, caddisfly, good water, very healthy. Dragonfly, water penny, scud, um, healthy, unhealthy is the black fly, a uh, little guy there, they stand up like little bottles in the bottom of the water, leech, you wouldn't think that that would be unhealthy water, and you'd be right, and then there's some others over there. So, uh, come on along, we're looking for volunteers to do that. One of the things that we've been doing recently, um, the county updates to the steep slope rules for the mountain and hill slope <laughs> development ordinance. Uh, there was a hearing uh, about a month ago, and uh, then there was a follow-up hearing recently. But under the old rules, there were some density requirements that may have said big lots up on the steep slopes, where the blue is, the, the steeper slopes. Because there are no density requirements under the current proposed uh, uh, revisions, there's the opportunity for many, many more sites on very steep slopes. So uh, that's one of the things that some of us who are interested in, uh, in this case, might get in downstream uh, this sort of development almost cries out much more mud into the streams. Roger, in the hood, it, this is sort of like throwing the uh, lambs to the wolves, but there are two planning board members here. Tom Rogers has been on the board about Appreciate less than time. six months, and Burke Cornegay was appointed last night to the planning board. So those are the two. You're welcome. Good to see you. Uh, the no is an editorial no. And those are some of the decisions that need to be made. And then we come on to the talk that we're going to have right now. Uh, but when it goes around, I hope you sign in. Um, do you have this? Is it a sign in sheet going around? And there we go. And you can check off some things that you might be interested in or uh, just give me some information so I can contact you later. I think we're pretty well set here. Zach, would you like to come on? Sure thing. Uh, Zach is a student who's working with the Watershed Association. Yes. And we're going to be taking off at the end of May and going going to Pittsburgh. Going to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And where will we go to? What's the, the river? The River Rally. River Rally. River Network, which 
is just a giant network of groups like ourselves gets together once a year and it's really exciting. Anybody else wants to come along and has a few extra dollars burning the hole in their pockets? <laughs> <laughs> so before I start, I wanted to say there's a correction on the announcement that said that the Jackson County mapping project was uh, stopped due to a tight county budget. Uh, in fact, it was actually the state cut because the state cut funding. So, but um, anyways, it's uh, I'm happy to introduce Miss Jennifer Bauer. She is a licensed geologist and co-owner of the Appalachian Landslide Consultants. She started the ALC in December of 2011 after working with the North Carolina Geologic Survey Lens. Uh, surveys landslide hazard mapping team since 2005 and uh, she prior to working to the state she gained experience in ge engineering consulting from Raleigh North Carolina after getting her bachelor of science in geology from the UNC Chapel Hill in 2001 so without further ado Ms. Jennifer Bell. thank you Zach and Roger and thanks to all of you for being here this evening I really appreciate it I want to start just by asking, well, I want to start by starting my presentation. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and just asking, how many of you have ever seen a landslide? Several. Yeah, how many? During. Well, if you've seen during, that's impressive. <laughs> how many of you know somebody that have, has had one on their property? Has dealt with it, yeah. How many of you have been impacted by a landslide? The last question is kind of a trick question because we have all been impacted by landslides. <laughs> and tonight that's what I'm going to tell you about, some of the reasons that we should care about landslides. I'll start with just talking a little bit about the cost of landslides, the human cost and the financial costs, and I'll move on to talking about how knowing about landslides can help when we, because we all live in the mountains and that's continuing, more people are moving here. Then I'll talk about how landslides impact water quality, which I know is something that you all are concerned about. I'll wrap up by talking about some of the things that we are doing to learn more about landslides and some of the things that you all can do as well. So first, just to start, one of the most important reasons to care about landslides is because they affect human lives and property. Do you all remember, some of the younger folks might not have been around in this area, but in September of 2004, when Hurricanes Francis and Ivan came over the mountains, dropped all that rain, well those hurricanes triggered hundreds of landslides. And one of those was over in the Peaks Creek community, over in Franklin. You guys remember that? This type of landslide is one that we call a debris flow. So you're going to learn a little terminology tonight. And a debris flow is, and what happened in this case, was the soil at the top of the mountain up there was so oversaturated with water that it couldn't stay up there anymore. So it actually let loose and started flowing down the slope, picking up more soil and rocks and trees as it was going down. And this debris flow actually traveled two and a quarter miles down to the valley bottom. And the people who lived down there didn't know what hit them. It happened at 10 o'clock at night. And this is down at the valley bottom. Now this debris flow, it de destroyed or damaged 15 homes and other structures and it killed five people. And these people, like for instance, this home here was upstream and it used to be two stories, you can see it had been moved downstream, the whole bottom story of it was gone. This home here was set back from the stream, so it had a lot of debris in its front yard, but because it was set back, it wasn't damaged by the stream. This debris flow, along with the hundreds of others that happened in September of 2004, really brought landslides to the awareness of people who live here in the mountains, as well as the North Carolina Gener General Assembly. They granted funding for the North Carolina Geological Survey to start the landslide hazard mapping program that Zach mentioned I was a part of. During that program, we were able to do landslide hazard mapping, and I say we, Stephen and I were both members of the team that did this mapping. And we finished mapping in Macon, Watauga, Buncombe, and Henderson counties, and had just started mapping Jackson County when, like Zach said, the funding 
the state ended the funding for that program. Well, Stephen and I felt so strongly about the information that we were putting together and how important it was for the people of Western North Carolina to have this information that we decided to start our own company and continue to provide these mapping services so that people would have this information. While we were at the survey and over the last two years that Stephen and I have been mapping, we have gathered information on over 3,500 landslides in North Carolina. And these are from 1916. We also know about over 3,300 landslide deposits, which are areas where we know landslides have come down and they've deposited the soil and this, these rocks, but we don't know exactly where they started or when they occurred. So some of them could be thousands or hundreds of thousands of years old. But we knew that landslides contributed to those areas, so we were mapping those as well. Oh, some of the costs that I mentioned, that the reasons we should care about landslides, are there are human costs. 48 people have been killed by landslides since the year 1916. Over 85 homes and other structures have been damaged or destroyed. And these, this might not sound like a big number, but when you're one of those people who has their house destroyed, that's a big number to you. Because landslides are not covered by homeowners insurance. If it happens to you, you have to pay for it. So that's something, another reason we should care. Some of the more, these are just a couple examples of the financial costs that impact all of us as taxpayers. It cost us or $1.3 million to clean up that Peaks Creek debris flow, all that debris down at the bottom, and then to buy out the land from the people who owned it that was affected by the landslides was $3.2 million. And that was all of us pitching in, whether we knew it happened or not, we were all paying for that. Do you all remember in 2011 in Ghost Town at Maggie Valley, the embankment failure, or the embankment up there failed? That cleanup and to stabilize that slope cost us $1.4 million. So that's, that's not an insignificant number. <laughs> In addition to the costs as a reason for us to care about landslides, we should all, ca all care because we are living in the mountains. People are continuing to move in the, into the mountains. And the flat places, they're all built upon. All the good, nice, easy to build on places. Most of those are taken up. So people want the views. The development is going up the mountains. And when you go up the mountains, that's when the slopes get steeper and the chance of a landslide happen, happen, happening goes up. I want to just give you some statistics about landslides in Jackson County, we know of 171 of them, and this is before we've done comprehensive mapping throughout the county. 74% of those 171 that we know about have happened on slopes that humans have modified. So the slopes that have been constructed to be either fill slopes or cut slopes, some kind of in-between, these are the ones that can be prevented. These are the ones that we have control over how we are constructing these slopes. Now most of those landslides happen on a slope steepness that is greater than 20 degrees or 36 percent. So that it's the steepness that where they start, like the shallowest, is over 20 degrees. But most of those happen on slopes or the average steepness of the slope is 33 degrees. So that's quite a bit steeper than the 20. 65% slope for those who think in percents rather than degrees. So just a few statistics to let you know some of the things, the slopes that we're building on are starting to get steeper and we can prevent some of these things. I want to give you an example of, yep. Can we just go back one second? Sure. The average ground slope for most landslides is 65%. For those that happened on modified slopes, on modified. that's the average original pre-construction slope. So the average steepness of the pre-construction slope. What, what percentage happened that you said above 20 degrees is when it really it begins to, to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So what percentage of, of 
landslides happen in that lower percentage. Like below 20? No, between 20 and... And 33? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know a number right offhand. Stephen, do you remember? I know we have a, a nice bar graph that I didn't want to bore you guys with tonight. But <laughs> in Western North Carolina in general, um, I think it's something like 95 or more percent of modified landslides happen on the slopes greater than 20 percent. Um, 20 degrees. Yeah, 20 degrees. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily know how many happen in that interval between 20 and... It, it, it would seem like an important note because like in the Jackson County uh, ordinance that for the proposed changes to the ordinance, they're lowering it from 35 degrees to... Uh, no, they're raising it from 30 degrees to 35 degrees. Percent. 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 Yeah, I know, it's confusing. <laughs> the difference between percent and degrees is confusing. But in the slope ordinance, it's percent. So they're raising it from 30 to 35 percent. And we're saying they start at 36 percent. Most of them start at 36. So the ordinance will capture the steepness of where they start. I think that's the question that you were asking, right? Yeah. Okay. Does that clear it up for you guys? Okay. All right. <laughs> so to move on to this example here in Jackson County, this is a debris slide. So I'll teach you a little more ter terminology. As opposed to a debris flow, a debris slide happens when this block of material stays intact as it moves. So rather than breaking up and flowing, it stays intact, the soil, and moves as a block down the slope. In this example, this development had some culverts along here that had gotten blocked up. And then last year during all that rain in May and July, instead of the water flowing through the culvert, it was flowing over the road and then down into this fill slope. So the fill slope was getting oversaturated. <coughs> then to complicate the problem, the landowner at the bottom of the slope cut out the tow, the bottom of the hill, so that they could put in this addition to their house. A that was my next statement. <laughs> <laughs> when the county staff went out there to take a look at what happened, they saw that the cut had been made, this building had been put in without a permit, and it's no longer there. So two lessons in that story. Always get a permit. <laughs> and if you're going to cut the toe out of a slope, have it engineered have it designed and engineered to make sure that it's not going to fail down onto your whatever you're putting in there. The third reason that I'm talking about tonight, why we should know about landslides, is because they impact water quality. A typical embankment failure, a fill slope failure, of a, just a typical size that we map, can contribute 400 tons of material. That's 20 dump truck loads. 20 dump truck loads going into the water, disturbing the ecosystem all the, of all those macro invertebrates that Roger was showing us. <laughs> this is an example of one that happened over in the Bent Creek Experimental Forest in Asheville. Just a simple forest service road that had failed because a culvert got blocked and water was running over the side. And now all this mud is just going right into the stream and to clean one of these things up is expensive, or to repair it can be expensive. That ghost town failure I was talking about that happened in 2011, that one contributed 27,500 cubic yards of sediment to, to Jonathan Creek. That's a lot of mud to try and take care of and to try and clean up. Here's a picture of it. You can see just how it's made up of root balls and just clumps of mud, basically. And the snow really helps it to show. <laughs> Here's another Jackson County example. This is a debris flow, similar to Peaks Creek, but this one started on a, an embankment, on, on a fill slope up near the top of the development. Up here, it failed in 2009. And the failure, the debris flow went it crossed one road and it went stopped just above this lower road here. 
Well, in January of 2013, with all that rain that we got in the middle of January, it failed again. But instead of stopping up here, this time it traveled all the way down to where the valley bottom started actually flattening out. And this, informa this is information I got from the Geological Survey. We had gone out there in 2009 when this happened the first time and made notes about it, looked at it. And then again, last January, staff from the Geological Survey went back out there because the county was concerned that there were gonna be debris dams and they didn't want debris to be backing up behind because there were homes on downslope. They didn't want those homes to be impacted. So when the survey staff went out there, they found this. Look at that <coughs> impact to the stream, to the water quality there. That you can see all of this mud, these big tree root balls. It's just sitting there in the stream. Not only is it impacting the stream immediately, but see all of this the hillsides along the side, all these areas where these trees used to be, they no longer have vegetation. So they are contribu continually contributing sediment to the stream until they get revegetated. Where, where is this? This is the mountain heritage development area. So not too far. Yep. So now that I've told all of you why you should care, <laughs> why we know that the costs are high, that we're all living in the mountains and continuing to live in the mountains, and that landslides have an impact on water quality, you may be asking, well, what can I do? What can be done about this? And you all aren't the only ones that ask this. Last year, Stephen and I gave a presentation to the planning board because they had the same question. We know that landslides are a problem. What can we do about it? We came and talked to them about continuing the Jackson County landslide mapping program that we didn't get to finish when we were at the survey. And just to tell you guys a little bit about that program, the first phase would be for us to do an inventory of all the landslides that are in the county, just to figure out where are they, what kind of slopes do they fail on? What kind of failures are we seeing to learn more information so that we can use that when we are developing or when we are thinking about where do landslides tend to happen? We then would take that information and put it into our computer-based, GIS-based models that show one, where landslides might start, and then we have another one that shows the areas that they might affect. And these models are to, pr to show where they are during really heavy rain events. So not on nice sunny days, but on those days when we have a lot of rain, when the soil just can't hold the water anymore. We have been working with the Jackson County Planning <coughs> Department with Gerald, as well as the Southwestern North Carolina Resource Conservation and Development Council, and I'll shorten that to RCND. <laughs> and they have been looking for funding sources to start this mapping program up in Jackson County again. And we, we have started. They got a grant from the Appalachian Regional Council through the Toolbox Im Implementation Fund to do landslide inventory mapping in the Worry Hut watershed. And that's the one here outlined in green. And I think several of you are students at Western. This is the watershed that's east of campus. So up where the off-road vehicle area is. We are just now starting to get in the field. This winter's been a pretty cold, not pleasant one, so <laughs> we're now working on the field portion. And just to let you know kind of how we do this, we start by using computers to look at different vintages of aerial photos. We like to just look through the different years. We look for anything that looks like a landslide on the photos, and we, in we mark out those locations. Then we go in the field, we knock on a lot of doors to say, hey, we'd like to get on your property. Th we saw this on the photo, we'd like to check it out in the field. Then when we're out there, we collect information on the landslides that we see. We collect soil, rock information, slope information. Is it modified? Is it a natural slope? We collect a whole geodatabase full of information. And then we come back and assemble that into a, a database that can be electronically distributed so it's something that can be 
put up on a web map viewer, something that the public can have access to and use this information. Otherwise, what's the point of collecting it? So this project will be wrapping up around the end of May. What happens next is kind of yet to be seen. We are Jackson County and our C and D are still looking for funding to do the mapping of the rest of the county. The first step will be to finalize the inventory for the rest of the county. The next will be to do the modeling to show where the landslides might start, where they might go. And then we feel like one of the most important components of this project will be the outreach and education to teach people what we found, to teach people how to use the maps. Because that's where it really will come into play. That's where people can really use what we have learned to prevent landslides from happening in the future. So how can you all help? Well, the first step you're already doing, and that's just to learn more about landslides, to become aware of what triggers them, where might they happen, where do I need to even look out for them, that kind of thing. And just by being here tonight, you're already checking off that box, and I appreciate that. <laughs> The next thing is to report any landslides that you see. Let us know. We've got cards and pamphlets up here. You can let us know. You can also let the County Soil and Erosion Control Department know about where they are, just so that we can all get an idea. The third thing is support your water quality organization. <laughs> and that is because the information that you collect about the the quality of the streams, what level do they fall under? Is there sediment? How much is it? Are there slopes that are failing into these streams? All of this can be used to educate people as well as to apply for grants for funding to continue this type of mapping. The fourth thing is use the maps. We're putting this information out there and I guess the fourth thing comes after the maps are made, but <laughs> we want you to use them. when. When you are developing, when you know someone who is putting a house in, use them to identify areas where you can call a qualified professional if you have a question. The maps will show you when you do need a site-specific evaluation. And that gets to the fifth thing, call a professional if you have a question. Call someone, a geologist or a geotechnical engineer who is familiar with landslides in this area and can come out to your site, look at your concern, and, and give you some information based on their experience, because that's where you can really get some help. I'll add one more thing to that. If, if you support the landslide mapping effort, let the commissioners know, and there will be a request in the budget this year to fund a portion of, at least a portion of the study. They need to hear from people who support that effort. Otherwise, other voices who need money for other things. Why not? If you do support the uh, mapping effort, please let the commissioners know. Thanks, Gerald. Yeah. So we, yep, go ahead. <laughs> uh, just a question. You, you said earlier that 74% of landslides happen on modified slopes mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. but what do you mean by a modified slope? Because almost all the slopes in Jackson County have been logged at one time or another. There's old logging roads out there everywhere. So what do you mean by modified? Because almost all the slopes have been modified, at least by logging. Right. right. When we say modified, we are talking about a, any place where soil has been added to the slope or taken away. So some of those old logging roads are big culprits of some of these landslides because those were put in really quickly with not a, you know, they weren't designed to last very long. So some of those do end up failing. So if we can tell that it's been a cut or a fill, then we call it modified. If it looks like there hasn't been any human influence, like the Peaks Creek landslide, then that's when we call it natural. Yeah. In, in conclusion, I'll wrap up and then take questions. We have all been impacted by landslides. The, the costs of them, the human and the financial, are something that they're too, it's too great to be ignored. Because the, the trend of moving up to the slopes is not going away, can, taking landslides into consideration during development is critical. Protecting water quality is something that's vital to us, not, 
not only us as humans, but also to our ecosystems. And by knowing where landslides have happened or where they might happen, we can have the tools to help prevent some of these disasters from happen happening in the first place. Thanks. Can we go back to the slide that showed uh, the degrees and the percentage of mm -hmm. And Gerald, you have the presentation we gave to the planning board up on your website, right? Yeah. And that has a whole lot more statistics, like this kind of thing, up on the planning board's website. Just to comment on that, because mm -hmm. I, I sent you a question that after that briefing was given to the planning board about, about some of that data. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, as you've mentioned, the Jackson County study hasn't been completed. So therefore, it's not an exhaustive database. Right, yet. right. Hopefully it will be. Uh, and one of the other comments I think you made in, in, in a reply, and I think I even heard it said in, in one of our planning board meetings, is that uh, Jackson County probably has some of the steepest or most rugged or whatever modified or adjective you want to use in terms of its mountains east of the Mississippi. Uh, it's, if you take a look, if you take a look at some of the maps like we have, where we color code various areas that exceed fill in the blank percent mm -hmm. of slope, uh, it just jumps out right out at you at how steep the slopes really are. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I have you know one concern about setting a percentage right now different than what we've had historically is because you know my motto is first do no harm. Uh, and and if you start increasing the percentage uh, of allowable construction without taking into account special considerations, how you should mitigate certain actions and, and other prudent things to do. Um, I think we could be, you know, getting into an area that it's marginal. You know, that that 30, 35 percent is a gray area. Uh, you know, by nodding your head, I think you're agreeing with mm -hmm. me. That, that, that is a gray area. Yeah. And it's to me, it's still TBD until. The, all of Jackson okay. County is, is mapped, and we know what, exactly what has occurred historically. Uh, a long time ago, what we go historically as in thousands of years, maybe, uh, and, and obviously some of the more recent examples that you've given. So, is, is that a coherent comment? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jackson County definitely has a high percentage of steep slopes, and you can see that just because the floodplains aren't very wide. You know, you look around and there's not a lot of flat area like you see in Waynesville or in Asheville. There's just not that large floodplain. It's very steep slopes, very close to the river. Mm -hmm. Yep. If your mapping project was fully funded, how long does it would it take to map your work on Jackson County? Do you have an take, estimate of that? We do. It would take us a year to do the... And then another six months to do the modeling. I think I understand that number three most happened on original ground slope greater than 20 degrees. The number four says average original ground slope is 33 degrees. Mm -hmm. Would you explain the <coughs> fourth one for me, please? Sure. The well, I'll start with the third one. Okay. The third one is saying that they happen over 20, right. so that's the lowest slope that we see most of them on. But if you look at all of them. If you look at all of those 126 of them that have happened on modified slopes and you plot it out, the curve is the average of all of those is about 33 degrees. And again, that's of the modified slope. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One way you could look at it, and it gets geeky, if you say all of them, or most all, close to 100% are over 20 degrees. And if the average is 33 degrees, switch that average over to a median, and just roughly 50% of them happen from 20 to 33 degrees, and the other 50% are just 33 to 30 40, way up there. 50, or whatever. And it would be probably a skewed distribution or something like that. But uh, mm -hmm. um, if I remember correctly, you just have maybe two 
Yeah, I don't Definitely. remember exactly. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, whenever, whatever gets published to the next one, do what she's done there. Do it degrees, but then in parentheses put slope. Or put slope and then in parentheses put degrees. Because people just can't go back and forth. That's standard kind of scientific reporting now and then when you do metric in English. Or something. Yeah, and I think we're speaking two different languages. The, you know, the engineers speak one language and the geologists speak one and the soil scientists speak one and <laughs> we're trying to merge all of that. Yeah. I think though something would be helpful to be, uh, make it more clear to people is I think on, with the uh, planning board, it's, slopes are talked about pretty much in percent, aren't they? That's right. Mm -hmm. And if you can stick to like percent, instead of jumping back and forth, well, what's a degree, what's a percent, stick to one or the other, it'll be more clear. And I think percent tends to be the more common way talking about the slopes here. Am I wrong on that? Yeah. It depends on which group you're talking group to. Talking. <laughs> yeah, Jennifer, Jennifer is right. The, uh, <laughs> every profession uses different terminology and what we're proposing. There are some things in the uh, revised ordinance that everyone would agree are good. And one of those is a little table that showed, you know, degree, percentage, and even ratio. Mm -hmm. Like one to one is so many degrees and is so, so many percent. So that's one of the things I think everyone would agree on is a good revision in the ordinance. The thing I Maybe. Have, <laughs> <laughs> the thing I have found is that to, to the lay person you know, that has gone to school, you've had geometry, you know, you've done, you know, all your isosceles triangles and all the kind of. My opinion is that people tend to understand degrees better than percent. Because and I would uh, differ with that. Say, this, is, this is 45 <laughs> degrees, okay, I understand. Mm -hmm. okay, you know, this is 90 degrees. I yeah, understand that's that. because you've spent your profession as an engineer. Yeah. For anyone else, <laughs> yeah. I, I would wager that percent has a better, because percent yeah. is easily what amount in 100. It's easy. Degree is, okay, 45 is like this, 90 is like this, 180 is like this. You know, it's engineer speak. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think having that table in, that, in the ordinance so everyone with different backgrounds yeah. and perspectives can look at it and relate. Well, I think mm -hmm. the table yeah. was a great idea. I'm sorry to interrupt, but... <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's a discussion. Or we just have a graph. Or just <laughs> or a tangent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, most folks have had you know, high school geometry and algebra, though, and that, I think um, I, I'd have to agree with Tom that in that I think the great majority of people probably understand um, degrees better than they understand just, just lay person. Lay person. They think you're talking about temperature. He's right. Real estate agents, when you give them degrees, they totally freak out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, we can't build on anything. Isn't most of the well, like planning board board too? For the particular thing about the ordinance, isn't most of the thing the planning board doing in percent? In percent. Yes. And looking so at, so at ordinances across the country, they're all in mm -hmm. percent. I, mean, I guess it's just planners are weird. So. <laughs> well, and you know, truckers see an eight percent grade, and that means something to yeah. them. So it's and you, it all well, changes. Know, and that's a good example. But if I wanted an idea of what an eight percent grade is, I know going up, I think up Cowie Mountain is about eight percent. If I want twenty-four percent, that's off uh, sh Shea Lane off the uh, uh, I forgot just outside Webster where Old Settlement Road makes a turn, and there's a gravel road that goes. Dillard Road, if you go up to Shade Lane, that's 24%. So you can <laughs> get a real good idea of purpose. Well, I can't tell you where a 20 degree road is or a 10 degree road is. It's not measurable. I know that above 35 <coughs> degrees, I'm on hands and knees climbing mm -hmm. up the hill. That's kind of how I gauge it. <laughs> Around 35, 40, that's when it's we start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 65% slope is. Feels like it's almost straight up. Yeah. Wow. That's when you're hiking, yeah. you're yeah. close uh, to yeah. hands and knees. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, what about logging? Uh, when a steep track is logged, what uh, consequences? What efforts? Or uh, uh, what what degree does that dispose uh, predispose that area to slide? What uh, measures are required when a steep slope is logged? Because that that's going on as well as you know building. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the regulations that deal with logging. And, and maybe Gerald can. The, uh, uh, county's erosion control and sediment yeah. control ordinances. They are under the purview of the State Forest Service. I won't say anything more. <laughs> 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 because that's a major source of runoff. In, uh, uh, and there, that's a real challenge. Uh, logging and agricultural uses are exempt from the county's ordinance. Uh, state funded and federally funded projects are exempt. So the, uh, the uh, new entrance road to SEC is not under purview of the county's erosion control ordinance. And any act construction activity at the university is not under purview. Yeah, of the county's erosion control ordinance. It's interesting that, and this is a side thing, but the uh, state has determined that the property of the Western Carolina University Foundation, which is the Mad Batter, old Mad Batter site, is not exempt from county ordinances. So when they start redeveloping that, that site and other foundation owned property could, would be subject to county ordinances. When is, um, okay, I have two questions. Uh, when is the budget hearing for, you know, like, to go over this? I mean, is anyone allowed to go and you can say your piece and say why you want the, more the, funding for this? The budget okay? hearing will okay. likely be, uh, the county has to adopt <coughs> a new budget before the end of June. The fiscal year is from July 1 to June 30. And the uh, budget hearing, we have to have our draft budget submitted by next Friday, and the budget hearing will be either April or May, just to watch the, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember, the commissioners meet the first and third Mondays of each month, and so it'll either be late April or early May for the budget year. Okay. And anyone, everyone is welcome to speak, and you can even go request from the finance office a copy of the budget and make written comments. Okay. And uh, how would I get in contact with commissioners if I wanted to make if you go on the county's website, it's jacksonnc.org. There's a tab that has commissioners and it has all their email addresses and you can contact them. I, I, I don't know if you can do it directly from that website or if you just have to go copy their email address and then use your email server. Okay. Thank you. One of the things, Joe, you mentioned was uh, that forestry and, and agriculture were exempt from county rules. And the Watershed Association can provide a, a function there. Uh, on a very rainy day, uh, Ken Brown and I went up Copes Creek. And we were looking at a number of things, and we could look across to a place that had obviously been, you and I call it clear cut. They call it two age cut, because they made two or three trees that <laughs> represent some other age. Um, <laughs> and we could see that obviously mud was going to be coming down from that and we measured the creek and, and so indirectly we knew that their best management practices weren't happening we called them up and darn if they didn't go back to the contractor who did the the uh, logging and put in the silt fences and the protections and uh, tighten down on them uh, we reported something else over in Greens Creek where there was a little problem right next to the road and you could tell right away that these, that, that group of foresters in the State Forestry Department were antagonistic. And they would say, well, the project's not done, therefore we don't comment on their BMPs till they're done, which is hooey, I mean, when it's, mm -hmm. the mud is already coming off. So, but we need more people, yeah. or people who, who um, say, hey, it's my neighborhood, and I see mud from time to time, or I see a slope mist, or something like that. Who are you going to call? Well, we aren't Ghostbusters, but we do, mm -hmm. we, we do get back to some people, and we have had mixed success. And you can mixed call the county code enforcement, and Robbie Shelton is the chief yeah. erosion control officer, and he'll get in touch with people with the Forest Service and DOT or Diener, and like yep. Roger and Water, we have mixed success also. Sometimes they're responsive and sometimes they're not so responsive. We need to tell the human <coughs> species that we can only live three days without water. <laughs> and you cannot get it back once it's gone. It, it's nuts. 
that we don't protect our water. Yeah. Don't get me on my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> and going back to the your question about logging and how that affects landslides, I I don't know what the best management practices are. I do know that we have mapped some old logging roads that have failed, and, and like I said earlier, the roads are not designed to last a long time. And we also see in California, at least, when they have wildfires and the trees are all burned, and we also get some of the soil impacted then. But those burned over areas are some of the highest landslide occurrence areas. The debris flows there, they actually monitor for that because it's such a high occurrence. Now here, the roots, if it's just logging and they aren't burned, then the roots do stay intact. They do help hold that. And if they're deciduous trees, then they'll grow back and you'll start getting that evapotranspiration back. But while the trees aren't sucking water out of the ground, then you still have all of that water that didn't used to be in the soil. So that contributes to it too. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, do you feel uh, that for the four counties you've, you have mapped and done the work, that that's had an effect on development in the county? Uh, have the maps been used? Uh, I think, well, most of them were put out right when development was mm -hmm. dropping off. So we're still in a testing phase. I know just from experience from our consulting business that there are more people aware of the maps and what we, we've done in Buncombe County. And we've given a lot of talks over there. So there are more people who are starting to become more aware and they're using them to say, oh, yeah, I do need to call someone to come out and take a look. So people who are buying property will call us to say, we saw that we were in a high hazard zone. Can you come take a look? Or we saw that this might be the case. Or this, we saw that we have a steep slope. Can you come just check it out for us? So I think that awareness is starting to grow. In Buncombe County, their slope ordinances require that if you're over 35% or you're in a high or moderate landslide hazard zone on the NCGS maps, you have to have a global stability analysis done by an engineer. So the maps are included in Buncombe County's regulations, but the other counties haven't included them. I do know that the just talking to the erosion control people in those counties, especially Macon, they, they use the maps internally for knowing when they're doing permitting or that kind of thing, just to say, okay, I need to see that this and this and this has been done because you're in a high hazard area. So more for information rather than regulation. But yeah, it's, it seems like it's still an awareness and learning process that we're, we're trying to be a part of. Yeah. Do you have an example of one of the completed maps for that would be? I can look it up. You guys want me to take the time to do that? I can show you with, on the, our brochure here. We have a little excerpt of how we have used a portion of those maps to help us figure out the best places to or least likely to be impacted, home sites that could be least likely to be impacted by landslides. And this is the stability index model, which is the model that shows where landslides might start during a heavy rain. So this is a little tiny picture of it, but that gives you a small idea. Mm -hmm. And um, I can look that up just after this if you want me to. And are the electronic files, like are, I guess, is there like a publicly available shape file that can be used by other consultants for other projects? Mm -hmm. The and geological survey has all of those. We have all of those. And the Buncombe ones are available on their GIS with their property boundaries and everything. The Bunk Buncombe County has theirs online. All of the other planning departments have them in-house, but and they can give you the shape files. You can also download a PDF of the maps from the Geological Surveys website if you just want to see what the whole county looks like. It's not quite as user-friendly, but the shape files are available. So when worry had is done. Will that be um, Jackson guys? I don't know. <laughs> we haven't gotten that far. We haven't gotten that far, and that <laughs> will be a subject of discussion and decision. I may have gotten to you, this question may have been answered, but I, 
have to pick word. Huh? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I can answer, you can answer it. We, we, Stephen and I gave Gerald several different watersheds to pick from that we thought we could do for the amount that the grant was for, mm -hmm. and then Right now, because of the level of development in that area, the concentration of population, and the visibility. That being, uh, I, would, I live there, so I'm guessing that you would describe that as a low concentration population, rather than high concentration. Well, the, uh, it impacts Cullowhee, and looking at the Cullowhee Township, that's 24, almost 25% of the county's population lives in that township. So yeah. looking at it from that standpoint, the, uh, all of Jackson County is low concentration, but that's mm -hmm. higher than some. And, and again, because of the uh, level of development there and the activity in the area. Could you uh, maybe go to the slide that where uh, the cut in the toe slope uh, took out this fellow's uh, un Regulated. There we go. Uh, so the guy is smart, and he goes out and gets a geotechnical person to look at. To look at. It. Would the engineer come to you to help together look look at the thing, or would he uh, or she uh, engineer do it by themselves? What's a qualified person to look at that? and make a building decision or building advice. In this case, because it is a, a cut slope that would most likely require an engineered structure, yep. then the geotech engineer would probably just do it on their own because they're just looking at this, what's this problem right here located right here? The, Are we talking a retaining wall? When we say probably. A yeah. retaining wall or some Slopes they will use soil nails, which the price goes dramatically up. But it can be more effective depending on the type of soil and bedrock that you're looking at. So it's some kind of retaining structure that is engineered. And as geologists, we are not licensed to design anything like that. What we could provide to this type of project is a, the bigger picture. What's going on upslope? that could be affecting this? What's the drainage look like? How can we divert water away from this to prevent this from happening again? We can look at what's going on on the properties above. Is this more than just a little cup failure? Is this whole hillside moving? We can look at, is there something going on downslope that's connected? So we like to look at the big picture of things. And there may be some geotech engineers that do that. Many I know are just project specific. They want to know what's going on right here and we'll fix that problem. So ideally it would be a team effort and we're still working on building those relationships too. If you go back a slide where you took look at the tiles. Yeah, up there. I want I want to find what I want to do. Well that one too. <laughs> that one. Yeah. Well my comment is it failed in part because two culverts near there, adjacent culverts, clogged from what I understand. And that's kind of hard to <coughs> failures, random failures near your project are very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what Stephen and I did quite a bit of mapping last spring over in Haywood County, and one of the biggest contributing <coughs> factors that we saw to a lot of the landslides that happened was just poor maintenance of the drainage and developments. So that's one of the things we're really trying to talk about is importance of a maintenance plan for homeowners associations for for yourself if you live somewhere that has a lot of culverts clean those out every fall get those leaves out of there because if that water backs up you don't know what's going to happen so that's one of the things we've really been trying to talk to people about because you know one day out there with a shovel or maybe a mini excavator or something to get the stuff out can save you fifty hundred thousand dollars a year so it's totally worth it and that's something else i meant to mention Typical slope evaluations like we would do before someone purchased a piece of property or some, before someone would buy a piece, they cost $500,000.
and the typical repair is fifty to one hundred thousand dollars for a hill slope failure. That's some pretty good insurance if you can't buy landslide insurance. <laughs> yeah, I like to comment on that. Looks like a friend's uh, driveway from me three years ago, and what they found the slope coming down is the guy had filled in with trees, whatever he had on the property, he put down the hill and they covered it with dirt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, eventually, people lost their home. Mm -hmm. They had to condemn it because the house was starting to slide down the hill too. Oh, That's before a steep slope ordinance. Yeah. So we do need the ordinance, we do need your work, and I, I think we need to talk to our commissioners and convince them to spend the money. <laughs> It's, in my opinion, it's a lot cheaper to do the work up front than it is to repair things at the end. Yeah. Like we are proposing to map all of Jackson County for 160, well now that we've got a grant already, it's 169,000, I think is what it said, 159,000, something like that. And the, cost, the typical cost of a home in Jackson County is 167. So if you save one house, it pays for mapping the entire county. That, that house that was lost was about $300,000. <laughs> the bank got nothing out of it either. What, what happens when the houses are lost? They're condemned, nobody, you <laughs> might as well throw a match in. <laughs> it's worth nothing. So they get no, nothing. Yeah. And you still, yeah. you still have to pay more. People had to file for bankruptcy yeah. to get out. Actually, you had a good idea if you, sit, if you hear a landslide coming. Pour some gas on your house and throw a match and hope it burns. Yeah. 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 My mom's covering her ears. She's an insurance agent. <laughs> <laughs> you do that. Thanks for all of you. Arson. 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 It was nice. Maybe it's time to go in every which way. One of my questions will be. Oh. Okay. He's got a question too. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go for it. Um, how about civil suits? Because often the landslide starts on somebody's property, mm -hmm. but it knocks out their neighbor's chicken coop or worse. That's usually the way they're taken care of. And the civil, the they go back and forth in civil court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you get trotted in, and the downstream guy says, he should have known that his property was going to fall down on mine. Mm -hmm. Good luck of collecting it, though, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. Now, my, my question's related to that kind of thing. But of the 126 uh, slides that occurred on one of the slopes in Jackson County, uh, do you have any um, data on uh, what percentage or what number of those um, landslides occurred on single properties or um, multiple developed properties? Do you have that breakdown or is it just... Um, that's not something that we collect in the database. It, that's a statistic we could probably pull out just spatially. Right. Using the GIS, but I don't know that I don't know the answer to that. Do you know that, Stephen? Now, are you talking about like developments that have problems versus? Yes, as opposed to is it, when you when you build a house on a, a lot of folks. We had a fellow speak at the at the planning board meeting. We talked about only 45 acres. We wanted to build his house up on top of the ridge, and when you do that, you build a long, curvaceous driveway to the top of the ridge. Mm -hmm. And my my question would be. You know, how many of those landslides occurred in places where one person or two people had developed a rather large piece of property and had a long, curvaceous driveway that was obviously a, a maintenance, a huge maintenance cost after, even after the monstrous construction cost? And how many of those would have occurred on those properties as opposed to, to uh, developments where it seems to me there's um, uh, more of a tendency to build better roads, I, just in my experience as a builder, that, they, that these uh, uh, roads, even though they're regulated by the county, it seems that developers take a little, when they when they actually go into a place, they actually take a little more care because they're they're more scrutinized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be the case. And I'm, I maybe totally off. Yeah, I, for that, but I, just off the the wall without any numbers to to back it up. I would say that. I don't know that that's what we see, and right. I don't necessarily know the reason to it, but in larger developments, the roads are typically wider, which means larger cut slopes and larger fill slopes, which are a lot more prone to failure. Um, 
but you are right that the roads and driveways to the house sites are usually the most prone to landslides, but they're also the most overlooked when it comes to design and construction. You know, a lot of people, they make sure their house is on good bedrock and, and constructed pretty well, and then you know there's not much thought about the road that, that gets you there. And that's an area where we feel like the modeling, the maps that show where landslides might start can come in to show <coughs> areas where you really need to pay attention to the road building, especially crossing streams, because that, that's where the water is already. Mm -hmm. Something could come from up slope, or even when you're designing the fill in that area, just to know, okay, this is this is area that's already unstable, so I really need to make sure it's done properly. It seems to me that the, the reason I, I, I keep pointing that in that direction is because it seems to me that most of the development now on steep slopes and, and ridge tops, at least of late, and Gerald may correct me on this too, would would be, uh, it seems that a lot of permitting in Jackson County is for large homes. There's not a lot of, um, and of those large homes that, that I've seen built in recent years, it seems that a lot of them are way up the ridges on a large tract of land with a long driveway to that home and do that. That's correct and some of that is due to when the, uh, the uh, county adopted the subdivision ordinance and the, the mountain hillside development ordinance in 2007 based on some uh, legal advice and lawyers are antagonistic and that may be the basis for this. They put in place a moratorium before that but the attorney didn't know that you could get vested rights so there are over, or over 7,000 lots in the county that were vested and don't have to meet the subdivision ordinance or the steep slopes ordinance. And those are the lots that are being sold and developed now and they're not subject to any regulation. Right. Except for the one section. Yeah. In the yeah. HDO, yeah. The the, section. The, that deals with the stability of stability the home site itself, but not the driveway going to it. It would be very helpful to have all that information. <laughs> You're just, I traced the county, the county <laughs> study from uh, 159,000 to 259,000. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as we are mapping, we do keep track of areas that are showing subsidence or looks like they're starting to fail, but they haven't failed completely, so that we can pass that information back to the landowner or whoever might want to know it because it's a lot cheaper to fix it when it's just starting to swamp down than after it goes. So we're also trying to make that part of the map too. Do you have any idea of the relationship between earthquakes and landslides in these mountains? In western North Carolina, we don't know of any landslides that have happened because of earthquakes. California, Oregon, Washington is a different story. But up here, it just doesn't seem like you get the massive amounts of rain at the exact same time as the earthquake. So that if they both happened at the same time, you might get more landslides, but the chances of that, I don't know if they are. It doesn't seem highly likely. It's, in this area, it's really the large amounts of rain that cause the landslides. Might go up drastically because they start cracking. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even open that door. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, Jennifer, thank you for ask, answering so many questions. It was a good discussion, I thought. And uh, I think we've got our marching orders uh, of whom to communicate our concerns. And I hope people will do it. Uh, I hope everybody has a chance to sign in, at least put your name, or we will contact information. It's important for me to know how many people showed up. It's housekeeping for me, which I appreciate. Uh, anything else as we say for the good of the club? And one thing I would like to reiterate, sure. uh, Jennifer mentioned that the, the longer uh, presentation that ALC had done from the planning board is on the planning department's website, so I'd encourage all of you who are interested to look there. And there's some other information even from earlier uh, when the, uh, what is it, the division of Geology. When you and Rick and Stephen started, <laughs> yeah. started the state study, there's uh, some information from that on there also. So
quite a bit of information if you're interested. And the, the other thing as far as getting information out and out, um, we agreed last fall that water would help in this effort. I'm glad to have this meeting. But when the results come out, uh, I'd like maybe to come to people in this room and other people to help publicize the thing, get people out there, because people need to know this stuff. And so let's take this as an embryonic turnout, and let's talk about something in the summertime when results come in for Rory High as a full-blown uh, audience. Yeah, we're talking about having that meeting somewhere in Cullowee, maybe at the university. So it would be great if you guys could get people to attend that. That would be great. Anything else for the good of the club? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we have cards and brochures up here too. Help yourself.